So, what I've got up here on my first slide, if you're very short in intention span like I am, this is the take home message. So after you've read this, you're allowed to uh, tune out. But what I want to talk about is that um, RAMs are, your RAM decisions are very important. They're an investment, not a cost. And a lot of people um, uh, treat them as a cost rather than an investment on their farms. Um, I'm from Abacus Bio, but the work that um, I'm talking about today is something that we do with Beef and Lamb Genetics and um, Sheep Improvement Limited, which I hope you've all heard of, is the National Performance Reporting, uh, Reporting Database. That's a part of BLG, and so the breeding values and indexes, they all come out of that. So the, the, first, thing, the first thing I want to do is I want to ask a simple question, and the question is, do genetics work? And so just to illustrate this, we've got a little picture here. And the answer is yes. These here are two dogs. They are um, obviously massively different in size. So we've got from a Chihuahua up to a Great Dane. And a Great Dane is not the biggest dog there's ever been. There have been some 140 kilos is the biggest dog. But these animals here have come about from domestication of dogs and selective breeding. So they've picked certain types of dogs that they liked and they've ended up with this kind of diversity. But with the help of a stepladder, um, these could actually be mated and we could produce something that was in between. I don't know what we'd call it, maybe a, a, a great duawa or something like that, but we could produce a puppy that was fertile and you could breed from. Okay, so that's dogs were domesticated, they say something like 10 to 15,000 years ago, so that's thousands of years of genetic selection. What about in farm animals? Um, a lot of you look a bit young, but um, these here are two carcasses that were taken from the Inverme Lean and Fat selection lines that were done in Coopworth. So they screened the industry and they found um, some Coopworth sheep. They closed the flock and they selected for and against back fat thickness. So one thing. And over 15 years, four generations, they were able to produce these kind of differences in these animals. Now this is solely genetics, this is not differences in feeding, it's not differences in management. They were one flock run under the same condition. And as you can see, got a nice lean animal here, it's probably a bit fatter than our current animals are at these carcass weights, but it was very lean for the time. And here's a fat line animal, we were able to make magnificent progress in terms of increasing the fatness. So we can make very big changes genetically in a very short period of time. So be careful what you wish for, you know, if you actually want to increase fat, we can produce a fantastic animal, and the eating quality of that piece of meat is probably pretty good, but that's probably not a very saleable carcass. So we need to keep, um, we need balance in our selections. Genetic improvement, there's a number of ways that we can do it. And um, so there's single trait selection, which is when we're just trying to select one thing, and that was what we saw with the, the fatness in the carcasses. But we don't want to do that because when we change one thing, if we just select for one thing, other things come along with it. And so um, a really good example of it is that the dairy industry has selected very hard for milk production, and they've got a fertility problem that's come along with it. So they find it, they put all the energy into producing milk, so they find it hard to get the animals pregnant again. So you've got to select for milk production and reproduction if you don't want that to go backwards. So what we do is that we, um, all sheep, uh, the, the studs are selecting for multiple traits, so we've got multi-trait selection where we're trying to make sure that while we move forward on the traits that we want to improve, we don't go backwards on ones that we, that we don't want to get worse. And the way that we put it all together is we use a thing called an index, and I'm going to talk about that um, in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But um, I just want to spend a little bit more time on um, just talking about the changes that have actually occurred in genetics that we know are genetic in the industry. And so I don't know how many of you, I won't get you to put your hands up, but hopefully most of you have heard of the Beef and Lamb Genetics Central Progeny Test. So um, there are several sites around the place. It's been run at Woodlands and Invermay um, and Ashley Dean in the South Island. Um, and also at Onslow View on a hill country property uh, close to Miller's Flat and in the North Island there are a couple of sites as well. Each year we get semen from top industry rams and we evaluate them on the same property. So same management, same ewe base and that way we can measure the genetic differences between those. So back in 2007 we uh, went looking around the semen tanks that were sitting around in all the AB centres and what we found was some semen from 1980s rams. So they were top rams at the time and there was a little bit left over. And so we put them into the ewes at Woodlands to see how much performance has changed. So this is not us being clever and saying 
um, we can do a flash analysis and tell us the genetics. This was a straight drag race to show how much the genetics had changed. And so if we have a look, I hope you can see those numbers at the back, but what we've got here is I've just divided it up into the change that we've made in different groups of traits. So with growth here, we've got weaning weight, live weight at 8 months of age, and live weight at 12 months of age. And so with our 1980s sires, they weaned at 23.4 compared to the rams 25 years, uh, rams 25 years younger, and they were um, plus 2.1 kilograms, 25.5. And we've moved on quite a bit for winning weight since then, so even more genetic progress there. In terms of live weight, um, at eight months of age, so an autumn weight, 37 kilograms to 43 kilograms, almost six kilograms improvement in growth. So phenomenal difference. And at yearling weight, almost eight kilograms of difference here. So we've made a fantastic genetic improvement to growth rate. That gives a lot of flexibility when you can get rams, uh, lambs off to the works. It gives you, gives you options um, if you're selecting for growth rate. What about meat performance? If we actually have a look at that, what we've got here is dressing out percentage, and then we uh, have been measuring meat yield using um, Alliance's Viascan system, and it corrects it for a carcass on a carcass weight basis. So a big carcass will have more meat. What we ask is, do we get more, uh, we scale it, so that we say, do we get more meat off that carcass than we would expect for its weight? And if we actually have a look, all of these have this letter NS here, which means not significant. So we've made the carcasses bigger, but in 2007 we hadn't actually added any more meat. So the dressing percentage, basically the same. Our leg yield, 21%, 21.5, not a big difference there. Our loin yield, none of these. So we'd increased the size of the carcass, but we hadn't actually added any more meat than we would expect for the carcass weight. Wool, I know wool's not um, contributing very much to farm income now, but there has been a lot of selection that's gone on for wool in the intervening period. So we've added 370 grams of wool genetically over that time, 1.9 kilograms here to 2.3. DAG score, DAGs is something that can be recorded in SIL and we've made substantial improvements there. So gone from one point, so it's just looking at the, um, a scale of one to five for no DAGs to, to um, very DAGy. And so there's been a substantial reduction in DAGs there. And I don't know how many of you look for beach and belly, breach and belly bareness. Um, it's a bit of tongue twister, but um, we there has it's possible to select for that. Not many people are, so we haven't actually made much change in that. Parasite resistance. So um, we've had very good use of drenches over that period. There were some failures starting to turn up. The the numbers it's um, it's a score that's that we've got here, so the numbers probably won't mean much to you, but the important thing is actually, in selecting for growth, we actually took our animals a little bit backwards in terms of their um, resistance, their natural resistance to parasites. So that's showing you that when we select for one thing, we could have unintended consequences, so we've actually affected the immunity a little bit. There is now, um, it's now possible to select for resistance to parasites, and so we've hopefully turned that around. But at that time, it just shows you, you know, you don't get anything for nothing in the genetics world. So great improvements in productivity, but there's some um, health um, problems that have, uh, you know, some little health issues that have come along with that. So all of those have contributed massively to those productivity changes that we've seen before. So we've r moved our animals a lot. The problem with genetics is, we, we make a small change each year, and so it's very easy to say, oh, you know, I'm buying rams, and I haven't really seen a difference. But when you just take a step back and look over 10 years, you actually see that we've made substantial change. And it, and it seldom really gets um, um, given um, credit to genetics properly. So when we're selecting for a whole heap of different traits, and some of them work against each other, how do we actually put them together so that someone like Russell on Twin Farm can select the right animals? And the way that we do that is indexes. And a lot of people find these really complicated to understand in a genetics thing, but actually most of us are reasonably familiar with indexes in some way or, for, uh, uh, in some way or shape. And so a really good example is the stock exchange. So on the news each night, we see the NZSX50 or the NASDAQ or something like that, and we know that if the number's going up, the share market is gaining in value, and if that number is going down, then it's losing value. So we want it, if we're an investor, we want it to climb. 
um, we don't want to see it fall. So the NZX50 is um, made up of a range of things that are in there. There's a range of sectors that go into that. Who knows what they are? Is there anybody here that's willing to put their hand up? I'm not going to ask them. Property. There's pro property, some of them. There's a whole heap of things that go in. So these are all the things that make up the NZX50. And so for it to go up, something like um, you, one of the big ones, healthcare, could go up and utilities could go down, but because utilities is bigger than healthcare, then the overall index goes down. So all these things contribute to it. It goes up and down. Some things do really well, some things might not go. If they all go up, the index goes up. If they all go down, the index goes down. And if some go up or down, the index might stay the same. But we just say the stock market's doing well when the index goes up. So for dual purpose sheep, the um, Sheep Improvement Limited SIL has just recently rolled out the New Zealand Maternal Worth Index. And it works in just the same way. We've got all these different traits. So instead of utilities and health, we've got lamb growth and adult size and reproduction. So all of these things are things that the stud breeders are measuring and we can get breeding values for them. And so the things that go into the maternal worth index are growth, lamb growth, the adult size of the ewe, reproduction, so how many lambs they have, how well they survive, and wool production. But the units are different, so lamb growth is expressed in kilograms, Reproduction is expressed in the number of lambs born. So what we do is we do an economic index, just the same way the stock market does, and we calculate out how much they're worth and we express it as cents. So we come up with a dollar figure for how well those animals are doing. And if our maternal worth index is going up, it means we're improving some or all of these traits. If it's dropping, we're not doing so well with some or all of those traits. So that economic weight can be positive or negative. So lamb growth, our top one here, is a positive because it actually earns you more money if your lambs grow faster. You use your grass more efficiently, you might get some seasonal premiums. At the moment, this one's been a little bit more contentious, but at the moment there's a negative on adult size because we don't want the ewes to get too big. They're a capital cost for you and they eat grass through winter when it's a high cost for you. So that's a negative. So what we're actually after is a, an animal that produces a fast growing lamb, but the ewe is not particularly big. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that our ewes are going to get smaller. It means that they won't get big as fast as we would expect, given that if we select faster growing lambs, we tend to get bigger ewes. Reproduction is positive because adding lambs um, is, a, is a good thing, but we also need to bear in mind lamb survival. If we push reproduction too hard, we get a lot more triplets, we get a lot more deaths. So at some point, those two things actually, it becomes a negative. And wool is positive, but it doesn't actually contribute much because wool's worth such a small part of your overall thing at the moment. But these get added together so that we have one number that we can actually use to compare our rams. And so um, if we have that number, then we can actually calculate out for your farm and your particular circumstances what one ram is worth. And so um, it depends on your system and there's all sorts of variables that you might have. So how many years do you use a ram for? Some people use them for three, some for four, some might hang on for them for longer. But you, whatever you do, that's your policy. What percentage of replacements do you bring in each year? What mating ratio do you use? Is it 1 to 80, 1 to 120? You know, all of that is something that you decide for your farm. And what lambing percentage and terminal sire usage do you have? Because all of this contributes to how you actually make money on your farm. So I've calculated that out. We've got here two magnificent Teflon rams. Actually, it's one that I flipped that I got off Russell's website last night. And, and if we actually had a 500 cent difference, so this ram here, his index is 2,000 cents, and this ram here is 2,500. So if you look at these graphs, um, we've got Russell's um, flock here for um, maternal worth, and it's um, about 1,000 cents, it's well over 1,000 cents better than industry average. So 500, it's easy to find rams that are 500 different in, in maternal index when you're going to buy rams. So what's the in in incentive for you to go and buy a higher index ram? So let's just say the farm policy, we're replacing, we're bringing 25% of our flock in as ewe replacements each year. Um, we've got around about 150% lambing percentage. We would use rams for four years 
and our mating ratio is 1 to 100. Now everybody will be slightly different to this, but this is just to give you a rough idea. So if we take that and we crunch the numbers, the additional profit that this RAM here would contribute to your system over this RAM here is $1430 over the lifetime of that RAM. Now, um, I was asking Andrew before that um, Twin Farms sell some high index and some normal index RAMs and the, the price difference is $200 between those. So the, in order to achieve this, $200 in order to achieve a $1,400 improvement in profit. You know, that's a, that's a very good return on investment in anybody's books. If we just change one thing, if we just say instead of running our RAMs for four years, we only use them for three, because that's what some people do, it means you've got one less year to realize those. There's our three years, and so we still are earning just under $1,100 difference between those two RAMs. So that's still an excellent return on investment. Just in summary, the New Zealand sheep industry has been making tremendous improvement, and so we know um, that the whole industry, is, but some RAM breeders have been doing better than others, but the New Zealand RAM breeders have been Im increasing the genetic progress. You people have been buying better RAMs, and you've been got more productive farms as a result of it. And that's getting faster because there are now a whole lot of new technologies that I haven't talked about, DNA tests and things like that. The speed that we can increase and improve these animals is, is getting faster. What the New Zealand Maternal Worth Index does is it balances the contributions from different performance measures. So we measure, we're trying to improve animals on a whole lot of fronts. What we actually want to do is do that in the way that makes you, the commercial farmer, the most money. And so it just says what's the right balance of reproduction and growth to bring the best dollar return to a commercial farmer. If you, you've, this is not to say that numbers are the only thing, you know, you need to buy rams that are good for your property, but numbers are an important part, and if you select higher index rams, it delivers more profit, and it's a pretty simple um, sum to work out how much it does. So, what does it cost to get a higher index ram? Not actually that much, what does it return? Quite a lot. And so, there's the thing at the end, think of your um, RAM purchases as an investment, not just a cost in your business. Thanks very much.